Welcome to Future Customer Value, where global leaders share their career-defining customer moments. On episode six, we are thrilled to feature Rachel Provan, founder and CEO of Provan Success based out of Brooklyn, New York. Rachel, it's great to have you on. Thank you so much for taking some time to speak with me today. Uh, as you know, we're going to be talking about all things customer success, the future of customer success, and picking your brain and getting a chance <laughs> to understand you know, your view on the market. So if you could kick off and introduce yourself and let our audience know who you are, what you do, and why you're in CS. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Thank you. Uh, well, like you said, Rachel Provan, I'm the head of Provan Success, which is a customer success leadership coaching practice. Uh, I've been in CS for over 17 years, and 15 of those were in leadership. I've uh, I've built and scaled multiple CS departments across industries uh, and everything from seed stage to Fortune 500 companies, been part of a couple exits. That's been fun. Um, and now I teach new and struggling CS leaders how to build and scale CS departments. Awesome. Well, I haven't speak up, spoken with you before. You have a wealth of knowledge and um, have a ton of great advice to give to folks. So I'm looking forward to people hearing from you. Um, awesome. Yeah. So let's kick off with a, a question, an existential question that Ooh. you had brought up in a prior conversation, which I loved. And given you've seen this industry evolve over the past 15, 20 years, right, across different types of companies. So let's talk about how has customer success evolved or changed over the past 10 years? And what does that mean for CSMs today? Mm, yeah, I I have that conversation a lot. Um, <laughs> just to give some pe just to give people some perspective on how we got where we are today, which I think is a very challenging place. Um and why we're not going to stay stuck there forever. So, I mean, when I started in CS, it wasn't even called CS, uh, as a lot of people will probably tell you who've been around as long as I am. I was doing CS. They just didn't quite know what to call it. So I was a VP of operations. Sure. Okay. <laughs> um, customer facing VP of operations. Sure. Um, but initially, you know, it was very much high touch, almost like management consulting. Uh, you would lead with like, consider me a part of your team. Like I am embedded there, you know, whatever meetings you need me to go to, you really had to deeply understand large enterprise corporations. Um, you know, I was, I was with embedded within a few million dollar accounts. It was very much like enterprise CS today, um, except maybe even a little more management consulting. And the idea there was just to really make sure we didn't lose these accounts, that we were really on top of it, and that they saw the value. This was also in the days of on-prem. Uh, we weren't quite uh, into SaaS yet. SaaS was just sort of starting out then. Told you I'm old. Um, <laughs> and, mm -hmm. you know, I saw the shift, but, but the interesting thing is there are so many relics of on-prem that are here today, like the QBR, totally on-prem days, that made sense then. Today, maybe not. Um, but I saw it go from this really high-touch model to it, it refined itself to the point where it was what we call it now, you know, customer success, where there was an understanding that we were to help the customer get their desired outcome. Um it wasn't, we didn't own renewals. It wasn't financial for a very long time. And it tended to attract these people who they didn't want to be in sales, but they wanted to help people. And, you know, they had this helper personality, uh, tended to kind of be people pleasers, very smart, very brainy, need a gold star and everything. Um, and it worked pretty well for, you know, kind of getting on side, getting people to build relationships with us, to trust us. Um, and then we actually had the room uh, during that time to help people get to what they were trying to achieve. Because of the level of technology then, no one was surprised that you didn't know what was going on with them uh, and weren't tracking right. them. It was just like, okay, so checking in because we have to, what's up? Yeah. How's it going? <laughs> like, this is our weekly to, you know, this is our bi-weekly meeting to, you know, to move forward. Um, it went from there to 
a very scaled model. So it's always existed on a pendulum. So very, very high touch all the way to scaled where everything was supposed to be, okay, do it all through something like Gainsight. Now that we can see customer actions, oh my God, we can program everything as if humans <laughs> behaved like machines. Um, you know, at times I wish they did. It would make everyone's life a lot easier, but <laughs> I hate to break it to you. Yeah. Um, and what kills me is so many companies still operate this way. It's like, well, this would just be logical. Like, but humans aren't. That's why you yeah. still need us, genius. Uh, <laughs> we know how to handle the humans that you don't want to deal with. But it got very high touch, like, all right, well, this is what it looks like if they're successful. So if the user data or the usage data deviates from that, that means they're not doing the right thing. But they would try to make it cookie cutter for all customers yeah. as if they were trying to achieve the same thing with their product. And there was a strong focus on the product where isn't our product cool? Look at all the many things it can do. And if right. the customers aren't fully utilizing it for everything it could do, something is wrong. Whereas the customers generally sure. bought your product to achieve something, not right. to be like, let's see how much of this thing I can use. Yes. Uh, I, I don't know anyone who's trying to like max out their usage when they get a tool. It's like, that's, that sounds like a lot. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but it has been, yeah. you know, it's been a very self-centered for a long time, despite oh its gosh. name, it's been very self-centered wow. and it's right there in the title. That's what kills me. I think a lot of people don't understand what it is. Um, and over the past, yeah. you know, five years or so, those of us who's, who've been around a long time and those of us who speak even louder than I do, which is uh, tough to do, but those who have a bigger <laughs> voice than I do in the community, mm -hmm. Um, have made it, have done a great job at articulating just what an amazing difference CS can make in the financials, you know, in Absolutely. retention, in expansion. Um, but they didn't happen to mention how long that took, how much money that took, how many people, processes, time, tools. For so, sure. or really how you got there, what we did to get there, just like, Get CS. Here's what you can get out of it, right? Right. I mean, <laughs> uh, what's it? Benefits over over features. Yes. But yes. now we have so many people joining uh, companies where they're like, okay, so where's my 130 NRR? It's like you gave me a Google sheet and one CSM. I'm uh, I'm not sure that that's realistic. But <laughs> I mean, too many CSMs don't even know that that's realistic. So we've gone from scale to then it went to everybody sell everything. CS is sales. It's the new sales. It's what? Yeah. And, and the worst part is people being like, it's always been that way. Yeah. Like, no, the pendulum okay. is swinging. Yeah. yeah. It's like, and it okay. <laughs> I understand why we're doing right. this right now, but you can't tell me it's always been this no, way. No, not at all. <laughs> and, and now it's even swung from that to nothing really clear just kind of the everything department and For like sure. you should you should be able to save the economy oh my um, gosh absolutely and it's this catch-all like you mentioned customer success 10 years ago was there was no name for it is this catch-all term but it's, it's still a catch-all term and then people are still trying is. to figure out what you're supposed to do and i think that puts a lot of undue burden on the, CSMs and the ceos ccos because the mm -hmm. ceos and the board say well where's the roi justify your value like, okay, well, yeah. you're having us adopt, drive adoption, make people happy, generate mm -hmm. revenue and increase renewals and expansions. That's like seven jobs. But and yeah, no, no value. <laughs> we should, we should spend our time justifying ourselves. It's yeah. the only job I know where I literally spent half my time justifying my very existence oh my and what I was doing. And that takes and away like, from what you're supposed to do, right? That takes it away does. from the actual end product. It, it absolutely does. But it also teaches, for me anyway, it really taught me how to communicate and how to focus first on how does this help the other person? I can't sit here and think this is common sense, right? right? Because I'm focused on the customer. They're focused on revenue and they're focused on their baby, their product. So you have to understand how to, you know, my whole thing is you have to understand who you're dealing with, the human that you're dealing with and yes. make it make sense for them. So it really taught me to do that with stuff that I really thought was self-explanatory, but that's because it was important to me. You For know? sure.
And and you mentioned this before, self-centered around some of the ways that the tools or processes may have existed. I heard a thought leader in the space talk about in this way, which I thought was brilliant, selfish data versus selfless data. When you think about Ooh, product, product usage or even CSM sentiment, support mm-hmm. tickets or these, yeah. these like NPS too, wall, right? NPS yeah. ob- observing, kind of trying to mm-hmm. figure out this customer. That's inherently selfish. And when you present that and put 10 hours into a QBR deck, you go to the QBR and nobody shows up. You're like, why? Because it's all about you. It's all about the yeah. vendor, not about the customer. The customer only cares about their problems and the problems they need to solve, as you said. And so the more you can make it selfless about them and understand what you need from them, that's gonna that's just going to be a win-win. Uh, but it, it's it's hard to do that when the tools and and there's so much burden and pressure and you're going to default to what might be easiest or automated, like the, the yeah. automated pendulum. But that, yeah. that might be missing the point. It Part of it is tr- having an ICP, you know, an ideal customer profile. If you're trying to sell to everybody, well, you're really not going to be able to automate anything because right. people are going to use things differently. If you have a few you can have a couple of different ICPs. Like I've worked in places where we had one ICP that was teachers and another that was, you know, tech sales. And they, the teachers used it four times a year and were perfectly happy to keep spending the money and were happy to like keep ads off it and great. And the tech sales people where if they weren't using it multiple times a day, something was very wrong. But no one could understand until we we sliced that down. Nobody really understood why is our data all over the place? It's right. like, well, because you're assuming everyone's using it the exact same way and they're yeah, not. Totally. And I think that's something I've been learning a lot and, and hearing from folks is unlike sales, which is very clear objective, objective mm-hmm. truth, we need to increase pipeline. doesn't matter if you're selling to teachers yeah. or you're selling to chief security officers. But the way that you engage teachers versus the way you engage chief Completely. security officers is 100% different. Even within the same company, you might have different ways of, it, of engaging and driving adoption and getting value. They're gonna get value mm-hmm. ways. And so it, it, I think that creates an, an additional ambiguity and a value for, for customer mm-hmm. success to have to figure out because it's not just how you sell and the ISPs you sell to, but how you how you drive value for those, 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 uh, those groups and yeah, it's hard. And and one I want to I want to take this in a direction that you had mentioned before, but the pendulum. I love this analogy of the pendulum because we went from high touch CSMs to now tech touch, low touch digital CSM, and it's always swinging. And everybody's mm-hmm. trying to focus on where is the puck going, right? So I'm curious, where on the pendulum do you feel we should be right now? Mm. And and maybe it's a, a multitude of things. But where what are people, you know, people are talking about this tech touch AI automation, but what is what does reality look like? Where where is the value actually uh, for for organizations? The value of CS for organizations is to understand what your ideal customer what your ideal customers want to achieve with your product. What what would be a win? What would make them say like I'm glad I bought that. It helped me do X. Right. That's what I wanted to do because it saved me money or it made me money, which is really all it comes down to. Um, but CS is there to make sure that customers achieve that success because, as I've mentioned, humans don't make sense. They're not logical and you can't program them like a computer. They're not going to run a command, even if they you think it makes sense for them. Like right. I, My favorite analogy is always the gym analogy right? You you get a gym membership. You're like, yes, this is going to be amazing. I'm going to have a six pack. I can't wait. <laughs> and then, you know, do you go every single day and it starts to snow and sleep and you're tired? And no, you know, yes, it's the best for you. Yes, you wanted it for yourself. You bought it. Why aren't you using it? Yeah. Because you're human and humans don't work that way. Our motivation is completely separate and based entirely on really not entirely, but mostly on evolution. And if you are not hammering home why this is important to them, they're not going to do it. And what makes it tricky is you've got to understand that for everyone along that chain from, yeah, from the buyer to the end user internally, your team, it's, it's being a chameleon a little bit, but it can also really play into what CS people love, which is helping others where most of them are very empathetic. They're very attuned to others. 
But when they're given just these mandates of like, you have to increase NRR by this much, it can't be about the other person anymore with the amount of time they have. When they are given that, that leeway to be like, okay, your job is to understand what they want, really listen, focus on them and use their language, keep it focused on them and what they're achieving. CS people are great at that. They, they just aren't given the time to do it. If we're allowed to go back to literally still right there in the title, making the customer successful with the product, their definition of success. Yes. The, what's funny is the misconception, I think, is that CSMs are here to drive revenue, but that's the outcome. It's not the task. Yeah, it's, the it's the byproduct, right? right? It's the byproduct of getting the customer to succeed. If they're successful in getting what they came for and having a great experience on top of that, they're going to keep buying it. They're going to tell other people and they're going to buy more. If you yeah. just, if you don't hit that base, you know, that, that one objective of like, Hey, this is what they bought it for. If you don't hit that first, none of the rest of this is relevant. Yeah, and it's it's such a a pain point about the the, the the going back to the selfish selfish versus selfless data. Customer success is about the customer first, but if you're focused on the product or your own perceptions of what you think the customer wants, there's gonna be a disconnect. When the customer can self define what success means, then yeah. everybody's aligned, and that's what we need to focus back on: is customer yes. defined success. Have CSMs be customer guides or whatever right. you want to call it but they should be leading the charge but they need a framework they need a way to understand what they're working towards because i think that's a big problem too customers often don't know what right. what they should be focused on because there's so many stakeholders and and you had mentioned this i love this point where people don't want to talk to robots right in the full world of automations these these digital csm chatbots aren't going to be the ones motivating another human being yeah. to take an action we want to talk to other human beings we're social creatures and i love your point about Humans have to continue helping other humans see what's important because just because you bought a software, well, the software is evolving. My understanding of the software three months ago when I bought is totally different than what the software can do today. And I need to be re-educated. And that's a, that is a human process. That's not, Mm -hmm. so I'm not going to always read a self-serve wiki, you know, because I have a hundred technologies I use. I'm not going to do that. I want somebody to tell me that and differentiate it for me, make it matter to me and I'll do it. I think of it a lot as habit formation, which is difficult for us when it's something we want to do, when it's something that we're being told to do by someone else, which is generally the situation here. Um, right. It's like your boss is like, we have this new thing, use it. It's like, Great. Um, if it is not so simple, you're going to have a problem. So with habit formation, what you need to do is make it stupid easy and, you know, like little chunks, teach it little chunks at a time in a way that's stupid easy. And then people are more willing to adopt it because it gives them a win, right? It, it does that little pop of dopamine, like, Oh, I did it. All right. (laughs) This is okay. Like we don't get enough gold stars in our life. We all kind of love the little, I'm like, yes, you're doing a great job. Um, it, I really study a lot of psychology and neuropsychology and behavioral and all that. Um, And I'm fascinated by just how much something like a pop of confetti in an email or a checklist can motivate people because it's so hard to get that satisfaction from your job and ever feel like you've accomplished anything these days. Wow. Very, very good point. And I think this leads me into another question, actually, which is wanting to feel accomplished, justify the value and show that you've moved the needle. And it's it, for for everybody wants to do this for CSMs absolutely, and for customers as well. But I'm curious what what is preventing that. So let's focus on the CSMs today, and they okay. have a huge role. They've got multiple jobs. <clears throat> um, they want to feel a sense of fulfillment, and we're seeing a lot of burnout mm-hmm. in the industry. A lot of CSMs oh, yeah. are leaving, or unfortunately, there's RIFs and all sorts of things happening. But what's preventing a CSM or a post sales team from being able to track? measure, track, and justify their outcomes. Uh, And what's what's broken in that world? That's where there has to be, and we're seeing this more and more now in studies, where you're able to correlate, um, and I'd even say, say there's causation with 
they meet their outcomes, the NRR goes up. Not a surprise, but right. still, when you can show it in terms of data, like here's what happens when we don't meet the outcome. Here's what happens when we do. Here's how much the NRR goes up when we do. That's what, you know, I'm a business owner. I get it. I want my revenue to go up. Right. That's going to be like, I have an employee now. That lights a fire under you to yeah. be like, I have to make sure this person gets paid. You know, it's totally. not totally selfish. It's, you know, a lot of it is because of the people who work for you and caring about them. But at the top, yeah, you're focused on revenue and that's okay. But that doesn't mean you can be myopic and not understand what drives revenue just by saying, go get it. <laughs> yeah, that's not that's not that helpful. And by saying no one can be successful at miscellaneous, right? You can't give people 30 things to do and expect them to do it well. You have to be very clear on these are the things that will move the needle and they're your responsibility. Go do that. Not, oh, and I'm going to need you to handle this and handle this and handle this. They're, it's becoming almost like um, like an administrative role. And it's like, well, but you know, it has to do with the customer. Or you touch the customer the most. It's like, mm-mm. And I even see it being in some cases, uh, like, like um, support for sales, you know, it's like, all right, well, I'm going to do this right. and go enter it in the, it's like, absolutely not. I've, I've told people like, you are not the geek here to do the jocks homework. And yeah. they always laugh, but I'm like, is that what it, <laughs> they're like, that's a hundred percent what it feels like. Yeah. Um, that's, and, that's fascinating. And what I also think is really interesting, and I think we had touched on this before, but what people don't realize is I think it's easier to sell initially than it is to sell a renewal. Oh my goodness. And selling renewal is still selling, but you're not selling the dream anymore. You're selling the reality, the warts and all, the downtimes, the they don't like that color button. Yeah. And And, people are like, oh, but they should automatically renew. It's like, that's not how it works. That is an assumption. That is an absolute assumption. And this is something that hot take on sales, right? But I'm going to say it anyway, because when an AE brings in a 100K deal, everybody celebrates. Oh my gosh, 100K Uh deal, 10X multiple. That's awesome. Right. That's And if you're selling an enterprise complex product that requires high touch CS, that is not a 100K deal. Why? Because the company has 25% churn. That's pretty bad, but let's use that as an example. And these products are complex, so you adopt only 25% in year one. So that 100K deal is 75K yeah. with the churn. That's less than a third of that with the adoption, right? So that's like a 25K, oh, yeah. 20K deal to start. Mm-hmm. It's not a 100K deal. Who makes it a 100K deal? Whoever is taking the reins to drive that value forward. That's customer success. That's customer success thought operations, error. account management. Whoever is yeah. owning that relationship has to drive the 100%. adoption, make that value happen, make them renew, and then earn that business again. We cannot take for default. But the unfortunate reality of the SaaS economic model is it's taken as a default. Table stakes is, GRR is, is 100%, right? And and everything is, Whoa. but that's not the case. No. Like we need to build in a better right. assumption and variables there because otherwise that's what's causing this undue burden on, on teams. We need to read. And that's why, model. yeah. That's why I frequently, one of the early things that I tell my CS leaders that I teach to focus on is customer acquisition costs versus customer lifetime value. Because all of a sudden you start to see, oh, we're actually losing money on these customers. Or, oh, that wasn't as big a deal as we thought it was. Now, we still get blamed if we can't retain them. Um, But if you're seeing these customers, stop selling to these people. Like we'll yeah. we'll say all the time, like this is not an ICP. Do not sell to them, and the and there's resistance to that because it's like it's money. We're bringing in the money. You shush. And right. what they're not thinking about is their operating expenses and mm-hmm. you know the cost of support, the cost of sales, and how long it takes to recoup that. And it can work out very frequently that it is costing you money. The sale is costing you money. Totally, the unit economics of sales-led growth versus product-led growth and our customer-led growth are totally different. And to really understand which model you're playing in, I feel like it ne- it requires a re-education of, of yeah. that. To the everyone, thinks, everyone thinks they're product-led <laughs> growth because they want to be. Yeah. They want it to be like, we're so great, people just buy more. But, like, guess, but that's not yeah. true. Right. And <laughs> like, guess what? The product-led growth companies 
are now like, well, how do we have enterprise sales motions? Because we're only closing tiny, tiny, long tail deals. Right. Well, the, the only way you're going to get enterprise grade ACVs is if you have enterprise grade yes. motions on the back end to support them. And yeah. you can't just rely on your product to win the day. Because as you said, I'm a buyer of 25 products. How am I going to know your product right. evolved to have four new capabilities? I need to buy those things, right? Like, I don't care about your product. I need to solve my business problem. Somebody from your right. team needs to tell me I have other problems that I'm not solving for that I could be with my with this product. Wow, okay, mm -hmm. now I'm interested. But to rely right. on a customer to self-service and no. find that out, that's not going to happen. And that's going to increase your CAC, decrease your LTV, and yeah. shoot your multiples in the foot. Like, it's just not going to happen. Right, and people don't realize that that's see that well they think customer-led growth should be our product is so great that everyone's going to stay forever and now ucsms just go out and tell them about these additional features that we made yesterday and that are still broken um sorry little little cynicism coming out there but um <laughs> but it's like well that would be great but that's not how it is like unless your product is so stupid easy like calendly they're a great example of both customer-led growth and great customer success um, it's really funny because if you think about it, it's so intuitive and easy. And that is something that it's also cheap. It needs to be cheap and right. easy, <laughs> yeah. um, leaving out jokes there. Um, <laughs> but that's what really drives customer led growth. It's like, oh, it's this great thing. You can tell, you know, it's a no brainer, right? It has to be a no brainer. It can't be some complicated, complex, highly technological tool that's going to require integration and Remember. things breaking and training and a wiki. And that's just not what you have there. That doesn't mean it's not valuable, but it means it has to be handled a different way and that people aren't going to get immediate value. Yeah. It's it's just too much friction. And I think that creates confusion for the team supporting it as well. You have to be aligned to how your product is 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 uh delivered ultimately. Yeah. And yeah. And sync to that that's value. Why, that's why when, you know, in my teaching and the way that I I author customer journeys, I actually started calling them customer value realization maps now because people right. have preconceived notions about what a customer journey is. And that seems like an exercise that's kind of a pain in the ass, but it's never going right. to really change much. This is what I think of it as, uh, what I think of it as is what's everything, you know, what's everything you need to do on your end as the company and what's everything the customer needs to do on their end to reach their desired outcome, like back and forth, back and forth, what needs to happen? Cause most of the time we just design it for our side and yeah. look, I get it. That's what we have control over, but there's a coaching relationship in customer success. You have to keep them coming back to what they're supposed to be doing because people will get off track and then they'll feel bad about it and they won't want to talk to you. So you have to guide them. You have to ask them questions so that they come to the realization that they need to do this and there is value there. Wow. That is, I mean, that 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 seems so uh critical to how folks need to be trained, but there's not a lot of great training out there for them, right? And that's why Rachel's here. Yeah, I am. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, uh, it's, it's, it's really important work that you're doing. And um, thank you. people need to- and it's yeah. not that hard. Like people hear that, they're like, oh my God, I'm in over my head. No, you're not. You don't have <laughs> to have the answers. You just have to know to ask them for the answers. Like, okay, well, who needs to be involved, you right. know? whose buy-in do we need? What is your, what does everyone's calendar look like? What do they care about? You know, it's just a list of questions and let them fill in the blanks because if they don't, they're certainly not going to do it once you're off the phone and they're staring at a blank screen after two other meetings, it's gone. For sure. For sure. It needs to be a constant, like you said, behavioral change and ensuring that that gets to be habit forming. Um, mm -hmm. So I want to take things in a in a slightly different direction here because yeah. we had talked about this prior. And I feel like in this world where there's so much responsibility on customer success, they're juggling 20 different different plates, spinning 20 different plates. It's a lot to keep up with. It's easy to default to what's easy and what's already there as a way of measuring yes. value. And mm -hmm. I think two areas, which I'd love to get your perspective on, your hot takes on, is relationships are no longer a proxy for value and customer health scores are... I mean, they're kind of broken, you know, and yeah. so relationships, people lean on relationships like, hey, I have a great relationship with this person. Things are good. Or my customer health score is green, right? Things are good. 
and they they, they, they no. think their job is done. So can no. you speak to both of those areas on both the relationship side and the customer health score side? What you know, what what are we what are they like what are we using them as a crutch for ultimately? Yeah. Huh. You know, as someone who's so focused on psychology, you would think I'd be like, yes, it's all about the relationship. It's not. It and that is a big trap to fall into. Right. Um, everyone has had some had it happen where they're like, how could they not tell me they were leaving? Like we have this close relationship. They yeah. never said anything. <laughs> and like I remember, and I feel so stupid now, obviously. But I mean, this woman, she and I would talk about like we we used to, you know both go to Rehoboth Beach growing up and we would talk about that no oh, she's going there with her family and here's a picture of her daughter and oh isn't she cute and what's your dog's name you know yeah. and I I felt close to her she felt close to me and then you know it got to renewal time and she's been with us a few years and it got to renewal time and she's like I didn't want to tell you but I was like what <laughs> what are you talking about she's like it just doesn't do what we need it to do I was like why didn't you tell me she's yeah. like because we knew what it could do and what it couldn't and we didn't want to hurt your feelings we i like you i want to keep wow. talking to you i was like oh my please hurt my feelings like yeah. but and that's the thing with being such people persons yeah that can happen but someone whether or not someone likes you does not mean that you've achieved a business outcome and don't get me wrong relationships matter especially in enterprise deals um, and enterprise relationships long-term because you've got to get multi-threaded relationships and buy-in through that system. Sure. But there's a difference between being trustworthy and doing what you say you're going to do and being kind and thinking that it's about being friends with these people. Because yeah. I hear all about like the relationships, the relationship. If people, I don't care how much they like you. If your product doesn't do what they needed it to do, they're out the door. Wow. Th this is, you just gave me a great piece of great perception here. Um, great thought here is you said that relationships, yeah, they're, you can't lean on those, but they are important for enterprise sales. Yeah. For multi it's almost like relationships exist to get you access to other stakeholders because human beings are very social creatures and we want to be trustworthy and we want to have our friends talk to friends. But the, the, the fact that you have a relationship is not the help. It's the fact that yeah. that relationship can get you to talk to six more people who are across the organization that might be senior or mid-level folks you don't have access right. to, right? And, that, and that's going to help you expand, but yeah. it's also going to be that they can tell you what they want out of the product. Because if they're yeah. not willing to talk to you, you're kind of guessing. Yeah. Like the number of relationships, in, in this case, maybe quantity is better than quality, right? Because- the quantity of number of stakeholders you have. If you have one really strong relationship right. with one manager versus mm -hmm. 10 like good relationships with the VP, with all these different people, yeah. like you have a lot more That's meat fine. on the boat to go and you know figure out what's going on. <laughs> because coverage. also right now, the biggest thing, the biggest thing I'm hearing about in terms of churn problems, and there's not a ton you can do about it, is change an executive sponsor. Because think about the economic situation. Oh People are like, yeah. oh, well, things aren't going well. It must be your fault. It can't have anything to do with the economy. I'm going to fire you, bring in someone else. And that new person's like, I don't like this software. I like my own software. We're leaving. And there's not, you know, I have a thing about sending gift baskets and everything to maybe try and like get a conversation. But most more than likely you're out the door. And that's happening a lot. If you have a multi-threaded relationship at that company, you're in better shape. For sure. For sure. Um, and you said health scores. Health so. scores, yeah. So health, let me connect the dots here. I don't think, health, I mean, health scores don't track this stuff. Health scores are focused on product usage, CSM sentiment, right. and maybe number of support tickets or something, right? These, these yeah. low hanging fruits to give you some indicator, but it's hard to capture the complexity of relationships or if you're solving their business problems. So I'm curious to hear your right. take on health scores and the state of health scores today. I'd say that it's better than nothing, but it's not, it's by no means going to be a predictive growth engine the way people want to think it is. For sure. You know, again, humans, not computers. And that's treating them as though they are. Like if yes. you're doing this, it means this. Not necessarily. 
you know, right. even in the sense of people used to just track logins. It's like, well, maybe they're logging in, being confused and logging out. <laughs> yeah. You know, you can't. And just because unless here's the thing, the reason for this is the real question is, are we getting the outcome they wanted? Yeah. Most of the time, there's no way to do that at scale, right? Because you have to ask. And the real issue here is that most of the time we can't see that. We don't have eyes on their internal business processes and outcomes. And we don't want to be doing the whole like, hey, checking in. Yeah. Everybody hates a check-in. They're like, I'm busy. Leave me alone. I don't want to tell you how your product is doing. Um, but a lot of, I think that for a long time, people were afraid to talk about like, no, here's the real outcome we're talking about. Yeah. Um, here's what what matters if they get it or they don't um because like but we can't see that and if we can't see it we can't measure it and we can't know that we're doing our job so what's the point of us right right and it's a negative feedback loop that starts to break break down and then and then you get hit with churning like well well, we did all these things you know things the indicators green i have a good relationship what happened what happened but if you don't ask the point of like are you getting what you came for yes you're not going to keep your customers and I mean, honestly, I've seen a lot more with with people coming up with systematized with systemized way, systematized, systemized mm, ways <laughs> of finding out this information, but literally asking the question, like you said you wanted to achieve this outcome. Have you done that? Yes or no? Like check, <laughs> you know, do you like me? Yes or no? Check here. You know, check one box. <laughs> yes. And like people are still a little afraid to do that. It's a fairly new way of doing things. But when I first heard yeah. of it, I, I smacked myself so hard in the head, I left a mark. I was like, <laughs> I have been doing this this long and I never thought to do that, <laughs> like as a scaled way of doing this. But for, it really sure. kind of gives you your next step. It's like, totally. oh, shoot, they're not, but we still have six months left or they are and we still have six months left. Great, let's go and see how else we can help them. Yes, and and I think it's, it's not rocket science. It just takes a no. framework. It takes a way of thinking about your customers' use cases and their problems in a structured, scalable way. Because that's mm-hmm. the thing what it comes down to, right? Is every customer's going to have different use cases for your solution. And if you can help them self-reflect and tell you about which one's most important, how well is your solution supporting it, that's great. So uh, yeah, I, I've been seeing this as well. And and um, the more that CSMs can, can have, can grasp onto something and kind of peel and look behind the curtain and and see what's in their customers' minds, that's awareness is a first step. <laughs> awareness is a yeah. first step to be able to take any action. And there's a uh, lot of fear totally there. There's that. there's a lot of fear with taking this approach because we have so much less control. But yeah. we never did. Like we we don't actually have less control, but I hear when Perception, I do yeah. some some consults with you know with business owners, they're like but what if we call out like, this is what you came for and they realize they're not achieving it. It's like, you think they haven't realized that? It's like, it's also like, it reminds me of when someone's grieving and they're like, well, I didn't want to bring it up in case you had, in case you were having a good day. It's like, it's always on there. It's right there. You are not surprising anyone like, oh, until you brought it up, I didn't realize that your product did nothing for me. No, they're aware. And they'll probably respect you more because you're being transparent with them. And you're yeah. giving them a solution because how many times does this happen where customers ticked off about something, CSM maybe doesn't want to admit it or it doesn't know about it. And then you come to the renewal and it's a, it's an escalation or you get blindsided rather than both sides knowing it's a problem. And then when it comes time to talk about it, the CSM already has a solution. It's like, hey, we know that you're right. struggling with this. We hear you, sorry, but here's the path forward and here's how we're going to get to where you need to be. It's a totally different conversation. And it, yeah. I mean, in a way that, builds more of a relationship in today's oh, yeah. than knowing what your you know your your dog's birthday is or something right, right. cuz <laughs> you think you know you think you know what you're in for when you have a problem it's just like they're going to try yeah. and tell me it's not a problem and here's all the reasons why or they're going to give me a 57 step workaround um right. and it's like that that is not helpful to me and both sides uh, there's a great book um that I haven't read uh, but I just know the title and it's enough. One day I'll read it. I'll get to it. But it's called Mistakes Were Made, But Not By Me. And that kind of like says it all. Yeah. yeah. Because 
we do have it it speaks to the fact that our jobs are you know evolutionarily very important to us we see them as part of our survival so right. our brains will filter distort and delete anything that says that our actions are making it so that we're not doing the right thing yeah. like we create different contexts like well yeah but i'm still doing everything right because you know, I did this and this and this. Yeah, they're upset and yeah, they're not getting what they came for, but it's not my fault because here's why all those things happened. It's like, take yourself out of this. No one cares. You know, can we can we solve the issue at hand? But people get so wrapped up in like, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God, don't let me get fired for this. Why is this not my fault? Okay, here's why it's not my fault. And that's all in the fraction of a second before you actually have the thought. You're not fully conscious of it. But there's so much of people protecting themselves rather than solving yeah. the problem. Yeah. And we, and we need to get, I think there's some showing the mirror to folks, both to the customer and to the CSM. So they know yeah. also here's, it's not about you. It's not about the product. It's about how both sides can get more value and it, it taking mm -hmm. yourself outside of the picture. So it's not emotionally, mm -hmm. it's not a hit on your emotional self. It's, it's, a, it's a critical, honest, self-reflective process. Cause that that's where the value is going to come from, not mm -hmm. from hiding on either side. So I think those are all great thoughts. And I want to be uh, respectful of our time here. I have one <laughs> question for you uh, that I've been asking everybody, and I'm really excited to hear your response to it. But as a thought leader in the space, as a thought leader in the space, Rachel, and having seen a lot of the market change over the past 20 years, if you could make one prediction about the future of customer success, where we're headed, what's going to happen, what would it be? Oh, boy. Um, well, I have bad news and I have good news and, <laughs> uh, and here it is. So with CS turning into the miscellaneous department, obviously it's very frustrating for us, for everyone in those departments, it's frustrating all around to the people who employ us. But what's going to happen is when, when that's the case, we can't do our jobs. So CS is becoming less and less effective and people are using it less. Um, and making turning it more into to account management or just making it as I said, like the miscellaneous department. There's gonna, and I think we're we're in the middle of it, honestly, there's gonna be a crash where a lot of companies go out of business because they're not meeting their customers' needs. And at that point, the pendulum will swing again to, oh shoot, we actually have to uh to care about our customers and what they're getting out of it. I do think that there will be an outcomes focused shift, which makes me really, really happy um, because I am starting to see people starting to get it. You know, they're talking about it, Gainsight. You guys are talking about it. Greg Danes is talking about it. I am screaming it from rooftops. You know, CS has a big old echo chamber and we're all talking about it. It will break it beyond there. You know, that was kind of the case of how valuable CS was. We were all right. telling ourselves, but it did make its way out. It just took a while. This part will get there too. Um, the, it's outcomes, people. Like it, if you build it, they will come. If you give them the outcomes, the NRR will come. So I do think I it will it. get, yeah, I do think it will get to the point where we get to come back, we get to do our jobs and focus on them and not be asked to do everything else in the world. And honestly, we need to get to a place where there's some appreciation for that because nobody wants to work this hard and then never get any credit. I could not agree more. Um, it is it is a very exciting time to be in customer success. It's also daunting given some of the macroeconomic yeah. factors, but I think we are headed for a, an incredible revolution of the space. That's gonna be good for customers and that's gonna be yes. good for companies. When customers succeed, companies will succeed. Ultimately, yeah, and everybody. Renaissance is coming. Yes. Renaissance is coming, <laughs> and, and it's it's been awesome, awesome to hear your perspectives on all this, and um, you know, and and being and thank you for being a part of this industry and helping to move oh, it forward. Please, you've done a great I could do job. This all day. A quick, quick shout out for anybody listening. Rachel has a great customer success leadership academy cohort that she does every quarter. It's please check it out, and you can hear a lot more from her in that cohort. So thank you so much for for all of your your time today. Thank you so much. This was fun.